I must admit, when I was out in Africa, I really fell in love with the elephants. I ended up having to hold the, the elephant's penis for about two or three hours a day. So I was quite, quite up close, and put, but I could hear every breath he took. And they were just such amazingly beautiful and graceful animals. It's such an honor and a privilege to be able to try and help some of these species, although they might not realize what we're doing. When it comes to the loss of wildlife on our planet, the data doesn't look good. According to a 2019 UN report, one million plant and animal species will vanish in the next few decades. But what if before they disappeared, we could just freeze them? You know, like a leftover pizza. In theory, by preserving these animals' genetic material, we could make more of them later. And that's where this differs from pizza, because honestly, scientists have no idea how to clone a pizza. But when it comes to animals, that kind of technology has been getting a lot better. The hope is collections of frozen samples that can act as a sort of biodiversity backup system. They could help us prevent threatened animals from dying out. Theoretically, someday we could even bring back animals after they've already gone extinct. But the science is controversial. Not everyone agrees on how these wildlife biobanks should work, or whether they're even a good idea in the first place. Because even if you could bring back extinct animals, what kind of world would you be bringing them back into? So in here, we've got uh, some, some black rhinos, we've got the Java green magpie, we've got the mountain chicken frog, all frozen here at minus 196 degrees. So these samples, these vials, little, little crop vials, they can be stored anywhere around the world. And, and each one contains the, the tissue of, of said animals. Fire preservation is a pretty cool thing, really. Tell us Matson got a start running an artificial insemination company known for breeding prize-winning racehorses. He's now on a mission to use this technology to create Europe's biggest biobank. Through his charity Nature Safe, Telus aims to collect millions of genetic samples with hopes of guarding some of the planet's most critically endangered species. So you first started freezing equine, which is horses, sperm, and now you've moved into sperm from all kinds of animals and it, that includes living tissue as well, is that right? That's correct. I love my rare breeds. I never love my rare species and I love the way, what can we use in science and technology to aid the preservation of of our rare and breed horses. And that's how I first looked into it. How many samples do you have at the moment and what kind of animals are you banking? It's about 56 different species we've done in literally in the last four or five months. I think it's just under a hundred different samples. So obviously some species we've done a, a, a few times. And I don't know if you've heard of the mountain chicken frog. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's only about a hundred left in the world. We're storing something called the Java green magpie, one of the rarest birds in the world. It's a beautiful bird, lovely lime green color. We've got a huge range. We've got cheetahs in there, all sorts, really, a whole mixture of animals in there. Aside from sperm, Nature Safe preserves genetic material, like ovaries, whole testes, and live skin cells. Of course, you can't just throw some elephant sperm or cheetah embryos in the old meat locker and call it a day. Freezing this stuff is a delicate science. And there's lots of different cryoprotectants out there, DMSO, some called glycerol, some called dimethyl from aldehyde, all these big long words. But they basically, uh, like the sperm cell, they permeate or they get into the cell and they can dehydrate that cell. So when it freezes, it's not going to rupture and expand the break. When we think of the brink of extinction, we might picture a species down to just a handful of lonely animals. But there are a lot more animals who are in an earlier phase of the process. They're entering a one-way funnel of disappearance called the extinction vortex. This is when a small vulnerable population enters a phase where their numbers start declining rapidly. A large driver behind this phenomenon is habitat loss. The less space an animal has to roam, the less chances it has to mate with a new genetic line, which ultimately leads to inbreeding. Take, for example, the elephants. They're in huge ranges, but they're still fenced in, so they can only breed with the ones they got there. So the inbreeding has started to take effect, and then you get poor fertility, as we we're talking about, you get poor semen quality. So what Nature Safe can do is literally grab a sample out of this nitrogen tank, and get some new genetics involved in the herd or wherever. And yes, it's the very early stages, but that's how it can really, really stop a species from going extinct. We're not looking to clone hundreds of northern white rhinos. That's not what it's about. It's about injecting new genetics to stop them from getting into that extinction vortex. The San Diego Zoo has been running the frozen zoo since the 1970s a biobank of over 10,000 samples of living cell lines, gametes, and embryos. 
In 2020, samples from the San Diego collection were used to clone a black-footed ferret from a specimen that had been dead for 30 years. Before this, all black-footed ferrets on Earth were severely inbred, having descended from only seven individuals. This makes them extremely prone to diseases and unable to adapt to environmental changes. The clone named Elizabeth Ann could inject much needed genetic diversity into the ferret population. This idea of, of genetic um, restoration, of restoring genes back into the gene pool is really important after you had something like the black-footed ferret, which went through this massive bottleneck because its population had gotten so slow. It started to hit some of those issues of the um, gene pool. Alex Dagan is an extinction scientist who runs Conservation X Labs, an innovation and technology startup focused on conservation. He helps designing things like facial recognition software designed to fight chimpanzee poaching and genetic barcode scanners. Although he appreciates what geneticists did for the black-footed ferret, he's not entirely sold on the concept of frozen zoos. I remember being in Madagascar uh, when one effort around frozen zoos was created, where there was a researcher who came in who was just darting every species of lemur that was in Madagascar and taking blood samples. And some of those species, you know, when you dart them, when you're putting the animals at risk, and if you're talking about populations that are all critically endangered, but this idea that we're going to invest limited conservation resources, which is, you know, generally we have 10% of the resources that we need in any single year to, you know, creating the, the, the seed bank for wildlife in the future is really difficult. We're making a bet on a future technology that may or may not work. There are very real risks to collecting samples in the wild, but TELUS isn't just darting down lemurs willy-nilly. Most of his materials actually come from dead zoo animals. Regulations differ by country, but in the UK, DNA samples from captive endangered animals can only be taken when they're being examined for some other reason, like a medical checkup, or after they've died. It's always sad because, you know, obviously an animal has to die for it to do it, but, you know, in theory, you can look at it another way. There is life after death at the end of the day to doing what we're doing. The problem you can get to that is obviously if an animal dies, it dies for a reason, obviously, and it could be a health issue that can affect the semen quality. So it depends how the animal passed away is whether we're going to get a viable sperm cells or not. That said, Tullis does gather samples in the field, like the elephant sperm he collected in South Africa. On top of the potential risk to animals, anti-poaching laws often make it illegal to ship these samples across borders or take them off their native land, which complicates the task of making a centralized library of genetic material. Now, if you're not able to bring samples from critically endangered animals uh, back to the UK, it's illegal to be shipping them across borders. So how do you work with countries that have less money than the UK and the US and, and other wealthy nations to get that infrastructure? Well, unfortunately, it comes down to the finances. So, but you know, crikey, it, it, as I said, it's so cheap to do this and to set up one of the first ever living tissue banks, um, you know, really doesn't have to cost huge amounts of money to do it and it and and already we can just we can send a pack of these vials out there it's dead easy by post and it can be to south africa it takes a couple of days to get there yes there's going to be challenges faced and maybe there is a way that we can move some endangered samples but i know there's a reason that's put in place to stop the movement of, of rhino horn and tusks and, and, and certain animals around the world that, that so we have to be very careful of changing those laws. Maybe the most controversial of cryobanking's potential uses is bringing an animal back after it's already gone extinct. The concept usually involves inserting the DNA of an extinct animal into an egg from a related species. A mountain goat, for example, acted as a surrogate mom for an extinct Pyrenean ibex in 2003. Sadly, the newborn ibex died of respiratory failure seven minutes later, making it the first species to go extinct twice. The technology's come a long way since then, and scientists are closer than ever to pulling off this kind of resurrection. But thinking big picture, some conservationists question whether bringing back any one or two or 100 bygone species would even make sense. We have only probably described, you know, less than 10% of the species on this planet. We have studied, you know, probably 3% of those species. So we actually, from the majority of the species on this planet, one, we don't know most of them exist. Two, we don't know anything about their ecology, 
the environments in which they live, the species that they depend on. It is an ecological community that is tightly woven together, right? All we said is we're going to take this one aspect, this one individual out of the environment or 10 individuals out of the environment, and we will be able to somehow recreate that entire ecological community, that entire system. That is to say no creature exists in a vacuum. And of course, there's a lot more to a species than DNA. Would a clone Pyrenean Ibex without Ibex parents even know how to be an Ibex? Who would teach it to do Ibex stuff? to find food in an Ibex ecosystem. One of the things that we've learned in evolutionary biology is it's not just ecology and genetics, but it is a whole set of intermediary factors that include development and evolutionary development that include environmental factors that lead to the success and failure of those species that include things like even parenting. And all of those have an impact on the ability of an individual species to survive. And then you add to the fact that our environments are changing, right? If we think about climate change, we think about those changes in, in the future the habitats that supported these species may no longer be there. The ecological communities that we have today are rapidly in the middle of change. We're probably gonna need all the ideas we can get to slow what some conservationists call the sixth mass extinction. Other periods of widespread extinction were driven by events like explosive asteroids or extreme volcanoes, which decimated life across the planet. This one's driven by a single species, a species that's somehow smart enough to bring back animals from the void yet not smart enough to avoid making such a big mess in the first place. Why it's happening faster and faster is you are dealing with multiple exponential factors that are working together, right? You just look at the impact of the electronics that this interview is conducted on, right? Some of the things from this are cleared, are taken through artisanal scale mining that involves clearing the Amazon and clearing the Congo Basin, right? If we have an electric car, the, it's the cobalt, that part of which comes from the Congo Basin that's involved in sort of destroying that natural habitat. If we're thinking about food, that food is being sourced globally on these supply chains. If we're talking about wild caught fish, we're depleting these fisheries and fishing down the food chain. We're adding microplastics that shed off our clothes into the atmosphere. All these things multiply together. That's why it seems like it's accelerating because it literally is an exponential. So, and for a long time with an exponential, that change can look like very little. And then all of a sudden you can hit a precipice and that precipice is what we're facing at this moment. So that precipice is now. That precipice is upon us.